So yeah, I'm Lance. Um, we originally, we were actually hoping to do this session in an hour and a half long session, but that didn't happen. So we're going to squeeze this in really quickly. <laughs> um, so I'll get started. Um, this is Ken. Uh, oh, I need to turn this on. Uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of background of what the open source lab does for you that, that don't. We provide a lot of open source hosting for large projects, medium to large, so like the Linux Foundation, Python Software Foundation, those kinds of folks. We provide co-location, server hosting, that kind of thing, a wide variety of types of services. Um, you know, we do our own kind of private cloud. We have, uh, we're mostly driven by students, which is kind of the premise of this talk. Um, we have full floor four full-timers, and we kind of have a mix of systems engineering, development, and then a meeting communications team at the lab as well. Um, and here's kind of a shot of our systems team in a meeting discussing events that happened that week and what we want to do next week, figuring out what we want to do. Um, and kind of, you know, we're really powered by our students. Um, you know, we have the systems team that, you know, they can do hands-on server installations, they can do machine deployment, configuration management, I mean, a whole wide variety of things. Uh, yeah, our, our development team, we work mostly in uh, Python and Django right now. We have a, a few Flask apps, a little bit of PHP and Ruby. We're getting more into the PHP. We have an Android app that uh, we're working on right now with uh, the Google Summer of Code. And uh, our dev students also get involved in, in UI work and back-end middleware, infrastructure, uh, configuration management code, all kinds of stuff. And we also have a media team. Actually, two of our members are media team are in here. Um, uh, but they help with public relations because over the years we've done a really bad job of like keeping our website updated and saying the awesome things we do. So we created a student team to kind of drive that force. So that's been really helpful. So we have a wide variety of, of uh, types of students that we have at the lab. Here's another shot of the knock where the action actually happens. Um, you can see that the, we have to keep them up to date on keeping the place clean. Uh, but yeah, that's where all the action happens. Uh, so recruitment, how do we actually get the students that we hire? There's a lot of variety of sources that we go through, um, either through just mailing lists, like the lug mailing list. Uh, there's an internal job site at OSU called Beaver Job Net. We've been getting a lot of hits on that, which has been great. Our website, social media. Um, there's even some uh, class lists at the EECS college that worked really well. A lot of it's been word of mouth. Even there's been like, we've hired a student and like their roommate. It's also pretty good, but we haven't hired them yet. So we interview them, and then we end up hiring them. You know, that's happened a couple of times. Um, and then we also have a two or twice a year event called Beaver Bar Camp around conference that happens. And that's kind of been a great recruiting tool as well. Um, so what do we actually look for in students? That's kind of the key thing. And, and, and kind of the reason why we have this session is that, uh, or two and one, is that we do things completely different than how PSU do. So you'll kind of see the differences. Uh, but <coughs> You know, really what we look for is just finding those students that just, they kind of have an app for problem solving. They know kind of how to, they may not know everything, and we don't expect them to know everything, but they know how to figure out how to learn and, and move forward, you know. Um, do they have a basic understanding of Linux? We don't expect them to know how to do everything, but have they at least done some basic stuff on the command line? Have they at least installed Linux there on their own on their laptop, whether it's in a VM or not? You know, that kind of thing. Um, can they set up services and so forth? Yeah, we want them to have some basic uh, fundamental programming skills, but we don't expect them to be expert programmers to come in. We want them to learn on the job. We want to make sure that they have the ability to learn programming more than actually knowing programming already. So uh, we want them to be self-starters. We look for, for people who are interested in doing things, not just being there to, to get a job. They, they're fascinated by the job itself and programming and projects and all the things that they'll get to do. So the, that passion is really the starting point for all of our student workers. Uh, of course, they need to be able to adapt and learn quickly. We have a number of projects going on all the time. We have a pretty intense uh, ticket queue on the system side. We have a number of dev projects. So they need to be able to get involved in a lot of different projects and learn and uh, think on their feet. And of course, we look for students with a really good personality, people who really fit the job and the lab. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those are really important. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to tell during an interview, obviously, but we kind of we try to, we have a variety of ways of kind of figuring that out. We're getting good at detecting uh, with a few <laughs> simple questions where people are. <laughs> yeah, we have a pretty good interview process. Um, and I know there's a lot of things we don't really expect. It'd be great, you know, obviously, if they knew these things, but. Um, you don't expect them to know configuration management. I remember initially we had a question about, have you ever done anything with CF Engine or Puppet? And almost everybody has said no, because they're just, they just started out doing you know, stuff on their own. They hadn't really dived that far into it. 
Um, we don't expect them to really have any production and uh, environment skills. You know, this is kind of the whole point of the lab. So um, we'll teach them that. Um, you know, it'd be great if they actually have been involved in an open source community, but they don't even have to be that way either. Um, yeah, they, um, we don't expect them to know a lot about the web frameworks we use or web frameworks in general. Uh, it's nice if they do, but a lot of times it's, it's better to get students who are really fresh on these concepts so that we can teach them how to do it the right way. Uh, they don't need to be uh, Git experts or SVN experts. It's nice if they know what Git and revision control in general do, but they don't have to be experts at it. We'll teach them how to do that. And we don't expect them to already be a rock star. Uh, we, we will make them a rock star. They don't need to come in with that to begin yeah. with. So how does the interview process work? So, um, and I took out a slide actually for this. We actually have like an introductory quiz that just kind of weeds out a lot of the folks. A lot, I mean, it's open book, but it's kind of get an idea of like how much have they actually played around with it. You know, we know they'll we'll use Google to look up some of the answers, and um, but it, it goes from a wide gamut of like what U, UID is root, you know, to okay, set up NTP to run with Puppet. What, what does the manifest look like? Um, you know, there's a wide range of things, and it kind of helps out. But you know, really, what we want to know is like, have they, how have they used Linux? Have they at least, you know, how long have they used it? Have they tried around with different things? Do they play around with it at home? Do they use it as a primary desktop or, or, or workstation? What you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, on the dev side, uh, one of the big indicators is do they write, write code as a hobby? If they come in and talk about things that they've done on their own, even if it's basic, simple, dumb things, if they've set up a a Minecraft server, if they've played around with any kind of web page design or scripting, that's an indicator that they're not just here to, uh, to have a job. And a uh, we have an open book screening quiz. We use the Moodle online learning platform, and we've built a little quiz. We ask some basic questions, uh, try to, to gauge where they're at. We don't expect them to get 100% on the quiz. We just use it as a way to know what they've seen already, what they've experienced. Uh, it's an open book quiz. They have a certain amount of time. They can use Google, whatever they want to fill it in. So yeah. uh, it, it gives us a good uh, basis to start deciding who to interview. Yeah, the, the reason why we started doing that was at one point, interview, when we would bring students in, it, it takes so much time to do the in-person interview that we had so many. It was just too much time and effort. And it was kind of a way to kind of make sure we found somebody that actually was at the level we wanted to. And then we have the in-person interview. And I can't remember the next slide. Yeah, OK. So I'll talk more about that in the next slide. But we also finally do an in-person interview to kind of fully understand. Um, diving into that, we kind of have it in several sections. We have non-technical questions, basically personality type questions, figuring out, like, are they going to be here during the summer? Are they going to, you know, how many hours? Are they, do they have too many hours that they're doing? Um, that kind of thing. And then problem solving. So we go through. All of our interviewees go through both systems and development type questions just to get an idea um, of kind of where they're at. And so whether that's just interpreting some bash script code and be like, OK, tell us what this long string of pipe commands does uh, with this input. You know, can you figure this out? Um, a lot of them are like, I don't know what this argument is, but I think it might be this, and I think I might be doing this. And it's always interesting seeing how they uh, figure it out. Like, oh, I see what it's doing now. And like, that's when you know, OK, that's the right kind of person you want to do. Yeah. You know, walk through some typical server problems like, Apache's not working. What would you do? You know, um, yeah, and so we, forth. We've hired a few really good systems guys who applied for development development positions, and I think probably vice versa. Mm -hmm. because we we ask them everything, and we kind of gauge where they're at on, on both sides of that. Uh, we check uh, basic fundamental, you know, programming concepts. Make sure that they understand flow control. We give them a few uh, sample programming assignments. We have them write a little bit of pseudo code to solve a problem. And it's one of those typical, you know, uh, standard programming problems that you see in a lot of quizzes, and people are starting to become familiar with it. So we, we'll probably have to change that soon. Yeah. So. Yeah, we also have a really uh, a couple of uh, coding interpretation problems as well. Uh, most of the students we bring in either know Python or Java, so we have uh, examples for both. But we usually have like a gotcha in the code that um, sometimes they, they do or don't miss. So it's always fun. So on the new hires, like what happens? We actually hired somebody. Now what do we do? Um, you know, we have this. There's actually a, a GPO uh, manual document that I found online more recently. It's the Linux training guide. Um, I put some URLs there. It's really cool. Um, but it's really great for going through like real, a lot of the basic stuff about Linux itself. Like, oh, I didn't know that you know FS Tab did this. You know, maybe they hadn't gotten that far playing around with Linux. 
um, oh yeah, I didn't know about that option with man, uh, figuring things out um, and going through it. And then they go through another part where it actually gets into more Sysamin related things. And so they spend probably the first couple days, depending on how fast they go through it, kind of walking through it and just kind of getting an idea. Um, and then after that, it's more diving into, okay, now we have this ticket, you know, okay, let's walk through this problem. And we usually have one of the more senior students or full-time staff that kind of walks them through all of that. For the developers, we do something similar. I, I've put up there just read the tutorials, which is sort of vague. Uh, we have a couple of different projects we work on in different frameworks, uh, mostly Django, Python, but also Flask. Depending on where we want to start those students out, we'll have them go read the, the basic online documentation for that framework. So we'll go say, go, go read the Django tutorial, step through it, uh, put together a site, and kind of get familiar with that. We will uh, have them install the project that we expect them to be working on, or several of the projects. We'll, that <coughs> requires them to go through our install docs, which is a good thing for us. We find some holes that way. Uh, after they've installed the project, they get all uh, access to our Git repos. We give them rewrite access right off the bat. They're a dev. They need to be able to commit to the repo. Uh, and then we assign them a bug. Uh, it's just that quick. This takes sometimes as little as a day before they're, they're at this stage. We try to find a bug that gets them into the middle of the code, that forces them to understand how the project is structured, what's going on. Uh, Sometimes that bug is, is suggested or passed on by one of the other student devs who's a little more experienced. And sometimes that other dev will hand them the bug and sit down and explain it to them right there on the spot. So they're immediately, uh, they get a brief overview of what's going on in the lab, a uh, brief overview of the projects, and they're immediately working on a, a, an issue. Cool. Um, so like in the first six months, what kind of happens with, with, with some of these students? And that's kind of the good time frame. There's a lot of information. I mean, even even with the media team, I know we just hired Josh as our marketing, and like he, he literally like what two weeks ago, and it was like soaking up information. That happens with it's even like it, even in real world when you get a new job, that always happens. So it takes them about six months to kind of get to the point where they feel pretty comfortable. So you know we'll teach them the basics of configuration management. Um, we actually have a, a mixed environment because we're in the process of switching, so they have to learn a little about CF Engine, a little bit about Puppet, a little about Chef. So it's kind of a little fun. Um, they get to learn like how in services actually interact. Like, hey, you know, maybe an event happens where a site actually is being de DDoS, and they're like, oh, I've never seen how this works. They see it in action, and they learn like, oh, wow, now I know I need to like check these things. Um, we'll also walk through some of the more common tasks. So, you know, there's a new server that comes in, and I need to know how to rack all that, and how do I do all the cabling so it's done beautifully, and all of that. Um, or whether it's just a virtual machine, how to use our virtualization service to do that. Um, setting up a patch to run, you know, a website or a service. Um, dealing with users, dealing with uh, our, our projects, like, okay, I have this problem, how do I communicate? All that fun stuff. And eventually they kind of learn how our infrastructure works, how other people's inf infrastructure works, and then uh, from the get-go we actually do full root at, at the beginning. Um, kind of the fear of, oh my god, this is Drupal.org, I should not screw this up. Kind of, you know, makes them be really cautious, but uh, but we do mention them. We do ex we do expect them to have mistakes now and then, but hopefully they're not like data deletion type d mistakes. Um, but we've we've had we've done really good with that. Mistakes are very effective learning tools. <laughs> so for for developers, it's pretty similar. Uh, they will be working on bugs and documentation. Uh, documentation on our projects, especially with fresh eyes, is very helpful for us. We find a lot of issues that way. Uh, our developers tend to work on several projects simultaneously. They'll uh, one or two, three, depending on uh, how experienced, how busy those particular projects are. And uh, we try to escalate the complexity of their tasks. As I mentioned before, we start them out with a simple issue that gets them into the guts of the code. Uh, we give them more and more complex issues, and as they learn and understand the code more, they take more and more responsibility. Uh, collaboration and communication, both with the other devs and with the community. I think you saw a picture of our uh, knock with all the students sitting around. Those are dev and system students for the most part. They, um, we've divided the talk sort of into dev and systems, but we run a DevOps shop, so our devs and systems people uh, communicate and talk and work on program, uh, problems you know, collaboratively quite a bit. The uh, interaction with the community is, is very important as well. We make sure all of our devs are on IRC. They're on the channel for the projects they're working on, if they're public projects. The Gennetti Web Manager is our main public project. 
We expect our student devs to answer user questions, to help users out who come to the, to the mailing list or uh, for, for any other channel. We expect them to be core contributors to that project, not just students working at a, at a summer job and putting some code together. And uh, over the six months, they tend to, to get very deep into the project. They tend to take responsibility for certain pieces of the code, and they, they really get some ownership and take pride in what they're doing. And so really what this does is it creates a really useful learning environment for all of these students. Um, you probably can't get this kind of experience anywhere else at OSU. Um, you know, all the full-timers and the senior students learn a whole bunch of things, especially the senior students. They start getting some project management skills towards the end, which you, you know, you, people that hire graduates are like, oh, that would be so great to kind of have these things. Um, you know, we usually try to find some tasks and just walk them through it, you know, um, try to teach a group of students, you know. We also want to give them ownership and, like, let them do what they want to do. So, you know, let them make a mistake, you know. You might cringe and be like, oh, you know that's going to fail, but, you know, sometimes the best way to learn is when something fails. Um, you know, the main thing for me is, like, just don't do it again and again. Like, make sure you, you, you know, you learn from those mistakes. Being SISMINs, we're very meticulous and we're very much, you know, following the steps of things. And so if you keep, you know, if you don't be aware of, like, oh, if I mess this up, it might mess this up, you know, that can be a big issue. Um, you know, as things move on, we have more advanced tests. So uh, from a systems point of view, it can be, you know, hey, we need a new backup solution, figure something out, or we want to do something different with our monitoring system, or hey, it'd be really cool if this tool would work if we help us out, that kind of thing. And you know, for, for us, it's really giving them root really is important. I don't know if there's anything else you want to yeah, add. Similarly with the devs, as I mentioned, we give them full access to the repo. We give them ownership of projects. There will be one student who has some seniority in a particular project, and that will be sort of the project lead, and they will be responsible or responsible for keeping track of the project, understanding what all the other students are working on, uh, interacting with any clients we have. So it, we really plunge them in and give them a lot of responsibility. And really, you know, when it gets beyond the first six months, um, you know, like I said, you give them more projects, you know, let them actually research something and, and design and do something. And that's where the full-timers can come in and be like, well, maybe you should think about this. And they oh, I hadn't thought of that kind of go to do that. And it gives them also something excited about doing tickets all the time gets, you know, really boring after a while for a lot of people. So saying, hey, let's switch gears and let you have you do this. Um, and it really, it's about, you know, finding new cool things that maybe I, us full-timers are too busy to worry about. And like, oh, here's this new cool finagle tool that, you know, maybe us full-timers don't know about and let's try it out kind of a thing. Yeah, for devs, this uh, last point about uh, learning cool things and bringing them to the rest of the team is really important. We see students really blossom when they get to teach all the other students something cool. You know, if uh, some new, new programming technique, new language, something like that, they get to uh, bring that idea in and we're welcoming to it and we say, yeah, yeah, go ahead and implement that. That sounds cool. Teach the other guys. That's really effective. Yeah. And, and we create an environment where we expect high standards, you know. We want each of our students to kind of push each other even more. Um, and it really, it really does set, a, set, set a, a bar of kind of being competitive, but not really. It's more about being collaborative. Um, the senior students kind of set where the bar is, and it seems like each year it changes. Um, it gets even more and more and more. Um, and usually the new hires want to become like the seniors, whether they get the cool internships at Google or wherever um, and so forth. But you know, we're always professional, but we always like to have fun as well. Um, getting close to my time mark here, you know. Um, for us, I think the big thing for us is like right now, summer term, you can work 40, 40 hours. Students uh, have told us time and time again if they work for us for the summer, um, they learn so much more because they're not bogged down from other, you know, schoolwork and tests and things like that. Um, they can get a lot of more productivity. They don't have to do a lot of context switching. You know, I, I, my arbitrated number of like three to four times more. Uh, is, 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 is I think is pretty pretty important, and uh, um, you know the younger students we really encourage for them to be there for the first summer um, and kind of learn a lot of things. Yeah, and they, they enthusiastically volunteer for that. They go, "Oh, I get to work over the summer. That's cool. Forty hours? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Can I work more?" Yeah. And you know, I think this is one of my last slides. Finally, so you know, how are we unique? We give them er root early on. Um, not many universities do this, although what we provide isn't direct to the university, so that's different. Um, we're really hands-on with our mentoring. We don't really have a program, per se, 
other than you know reading the documentation and kind of walking through things. So that's something we're going to hopefully change. And I know that uh, the PSU cat guru are going to probably talk about how they do their things here coming up. Um, you know, we have really high profile production sites that maybe we don't, some we, we manage directly, some others we don't. Um, but you know, our students get to have uh, experience with that. And you know, they get to interact with people from all over the world. So they get that cultural, uh, you know, <coughs> experience as well. And with OzCon coming up next month, they'll be at the Expo Hall, so they'll get to meet all these awesome people as well. So. Uh, quickly, you know, we're planning on uh, diving into academic, uh, more academics at uh, OSU, so we're going to build a program that maybe fits this more. We can impact more students. We're limited by the number of people we can hire. So we're wanting to impact maybe 50 to 100 students, um, and maybe eventually developing more FOSS curriculum at OSU, you know, whether that's classes and specific types of things. But we're really excited about that, and hopefully we'll collaborate with some other universities. So I think I met my mark, so. Uh, we'll, we'll let these guys go next, and then we'll have questions afterwards. Lance, how do we use the clicker? Left and right. Sorry. Hello. My name is Spencer Crum, and this is Willie. This is William Van Hevlingen. Um, we are from Portland State University. Um, and essentially the way that works is, uh, this is us. Um, inside of Portland State University, university means it's a collection of colleges. Um, one of the colleges is the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And so um, it's like a little college within a larger university. And um, people take, when, it, when you matriculate at PSU, you matriculate at PSU. But when you graduate from the College of Engineering and Computer Science, you, you graduate from that college. So we're going to talk about four things. One is the computer action team, um, which is the IT department for the College of Engineering. Um, the second is the program we run for students. It's kind of an apprenticeship program. It's called the Brain Dump. The second is how we use the students. Um, and then we're going to talk to some personal stories after that. So um, just to leave a little landscape, we manage, four, we manage the IT for four buildings. We have two main ones. One's called the Fourth Avenue building. One's called the Engineering building. We have f about 5,000 users uh, at the moment. And that includes six, at least 600 workstations and about 100 servers. We have our own kind of section of the data center as well. Um, and then we have seven general lab use computers, uh, hundreds of software that we deploy and manage for different faculty members, different classes. Um, a lot of it's very specialized. The EC students need a lot of special software to, for their classes. CS needs a bunch of specialized software. Um, mechanical and civil need their own stuff as well. Um, and so when, when you go to BSU, you get a a regular account, but then when you come to like computer science, you get like an account from us, and you start using the computers that we provide, which um, becomes important later. Um, we, because of all of the different software needs, we, we manage about four different operating systems. Windows 7 is what we currently have. We have a, a little bit of Windows XP left for legacy software that hasn't quite gotten there yet. Um, then we also manage Ubuntu, Solaris, and Red Hat. Okay, so. Um, in addition to those, like just generics, we also provide some pretty specific services. We still run our own mail servers because we're crazy. Um, we have web servers and SSH servers and databasing and, and project management and version control. And um, these services are directed towards our users. OK, so um, in the 1990s like, or the early 1990s, this our director, who's called Jonica, um, was running like the VAX, or I guess in the 80s, he was running the VAX for ECE and somebody else was running the VAX for CS or something. Um, and then they got a couple more boxes from Tektronix and boxes from Intel and they had, you know, all of a sudden he's looking around and he's got 10 or so Unix boxes running different kinds of Unix and not enough people who know how to do it. And he can count on one or two students going through the ECE or CS programs a year who come, who know how to use Unix. But that wasn't enough for the scale he needed, so he needed to start growing people. And so this became like a, I'm going to show you how, and then I'm going to hire you, and then we're going to run the servers together. And, it, and it, that program, that idea, just kind of kept folding in on itself, and it kept building, and now it's just way out of hand. Um, and at this point, it's an in-house apprenticeship program, which starts out with like 100 students sitting there on the first day, and we train them everything we know about computers. And somewhere in the point of a year they start being useful to us and then at the end of the year we're all running the servers together we'll do questions at the end okay so um yeah the, the basics are it's a one-year program um 
it's open to any PSU student or staff. Um, there's always a conversation about opening it up to the wider community. We'll have that conversation in the comments, I'm sure. Um, on fr it's Friday nights, so the, uh, what we ask people to do is spend four hours on their Friday nights from 6 to 10 p.m., which on its own is a pre-filter, right? There's some students that just are not willing to do that. But for those that are, Friday nights, me or him or Dave or somebody gets up who knows a lot about computers and dumps their brain for four hours. Whiteboards are filled, root shells are opened up, and the whole thing just goes. Um, in exchange for that, because it's an apprenticeship program, we ask that they spend four hours kind of monitoring our front desk and resetting passwords and helping users do things, feeding printers, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we ask that we spend a little bit of extra time. They don't know required to, but the real magic of this program is when they spend a little bit of extra time working on something more. All right, so the typical brain dump, uh, senior cat speaks, usually a lot of whiteboarding. We try to avoid slides because it's hard to like spread ideas across multiple boards that way. What we've just kind of learned is that yeah. the, the idea to, is to make a slide presentation like this, but retention is low. And a lot of people, you know, the first 20 minutes, they're gone. <laughs> and these are really like, some of the brain dumps are really like a lot of information at once. So if you have it on the whiteboard, it's easy for them to see where we, how we got there. Um, so it's, a lot, it's very informal. Um, we allow a lot of tangents. Um, we kind of like make relations between different systems and stuff as well. And um, like Spencer said, we start with a large number of people, and then we have a ton of attrition. So by um, the beginning of winter term, we're usually down 20 people. And then after that, we're down another 40 people. As people realize that they, they either get jobs, or they realize their classes are harder now, or they, they're just not interested in it anymore, and they move on. And I guess it's worth noting this is like a volunteer apprenticeship program. We don't, we don't pay these people, yeah, at least not at first. We, we pay some of them later. Yeah, we don't pay them. They don't have to pay anything. It's a free program. The only requirement is you have to be a uh, PSU student or staff. And unlike any kind of like a academic setting, we don't give them a certificate at the end that said they did it. Yeah, there's no grading and they don't have to be there. If they, if they want to leave, they can quit at any time. So this is, um, I think, a couple years ago group. Um, I think some of the people in this room are in this picture. Um, but this gives you a picture. I don't think this was the first day. This was several days in because they're taking notes already. But um, <laughs> yeah. There's somebody talking. So um, one aspect of how we teach these, teach all of system administration, which is a huge topic, um, is this brain dump, this lecture, this four-hour dump of brain. Another section is uh, the catacombs, which is a special area, a room dedicated to like hands-on learning. So that we've got a bunch of old servers. We have two racks. Um, they're they're pretty like they're old Solaris bo our sun boxes and. Like old stuff that kind of may have worked at some time, but now the memory is questionable, the disks are questionable. Stuff that Free Geek we gave have, us. We have old network gear in there. And, and the goal is that they have physical equipment in there that they can load operating systems on, load services on, get like a hands-on approach to it. And it's all like volunteer kind of based. So if they want to be there, they'll go there. Um, and Spencer likes to call them like self-selectors. Right. So. Yeah, so this is an element of self-selection. Some people don't want to spend extra time or non-structured time in the catacombs, um, others do. Um, the kind of person you want to hire as your Unix admin is the kind of person that's like, really? I can just play with these? I don't have to go home? <laughs> okay. And this is where one of my favorite things that I love to teach people in the catacombs, because senior cats come in and help them, because it's way too much to just be dropped in. But what I like to do is make somebody set up a static IP address and a net mask and a route, and then take it away, and then set it up. And just, and just go that through an iterative cycle until they're so good at setting static IPs that they will never forget that ever. Um, and this is a couple years ago. Again, this is me like taking out some RAM or something. And Donkey's like, I, I don't know if you should do that right now. <laughs> it's kind of, and this is obviously staged. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. They're, they're laughing. They're all wearing the same shirt that they put on. <laughs> but it, let's, it lets you look at the old network gear we gave them. <laughs> okay, so... In addition to the catacombs, we also have Scratching Post, which is cleverly named. Um, it's just kind of like office hours, so senior cats have like office hours scheduled, and students can show up and ask questions if they got lost in brain dump, or if they want to get ahead, they can ask like advanced questions there, or they can get help on some of the projects they may have been assigned as well. Yeah, so different people learn different ways. Some people learn great from lecture. Some people learn late from being dropped off on Friday night and picked up on Monday morning in the catacombs. Um, other people want to will ask you questions like they didn't get X and pro on a lot of these kinds of things at, after a certain level you can't Google it anymore right like if you want to know the basics of something you can get that out of the Wikipedia page but if you want to really know how it's hooked up and hooked up to the other things an office hours like thing is, is really the only way to do it um, so this is an example of that all right so um, 
at the beginning, a lot of people, we need people to know what IRC is because that's our main communication thing. We need people to know how to be familiar with our ticketing system. We need people to know how to use our account management software. And we need people to like kind of learn the basics of SSH and stuff. So that's where we uh, came up with uh, mentor sessions fairly recently. It was something we started last year. Um, what it is is a small, or two mentors and then a small group of the brain dump, like 10 people. And then in one of our computer labs, and they're spread across all the week, across the week so that we can get them all in. But um, what happens here is it's kind of a lab environment, and we teach them the basics of our environment. Right, so there's, we ask for four hours in exchange for the, the brain dump. And at the beginning, when you have 100 or 60 students or 80 students or whatever, you, no desk can support four hours. That's just way too many people. So what we do at the beginning is we ask them for two hours, and then two hours is spent in this mentor sessions. This is really good for teaching them like basic bash and stuff as well. The other thing that we have that doesn't have a slide is we've implemented like a checklist program, where which is just like a bunch of, I don't know, it's probably 60 random Unix tasks. The, the larger picture of our infrastructure is there's an NFS server, LDAP accounts, and then all the machines mount the NFS home directories, right? And um, there's, there's just, I don't know, 60 tasks, like write a, write a simple script, set up SSH keys. Make use, a GitHub account, you do a git push. VNC into something. And, and so these are, are a small atomic, you get a little check mark. One of us will sign your paper when you're done with it. Like it's for the goal-oriented learners, right? And one of the things we ask is that people, uh, we're not super strict about this, but if they want early access to the catacombs, we ask them to finish their checklist early, like all of the checklist or 80% of it or something like that. Um, and, and we got some mixed results on that. We tried it this year. I think we're going to try it again, though. OK, so then, yeah, we have students that don't work for us, and they have a root, <laughs> which is really crazy. Um, and the answer yes, is that yes, but not at first. Um, there's, kind of a, there's kind of a program they need to go through in order to prove themselves to us. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is that kind of like Lance's program, we don't run, we run the College of Engineering servers, not all of PSU servers. So we, these students are not going to be able to change their grades. They're not going to be able to <laughs> fake an email to a professor or something. Um, there's no FERPA or HERPA or any of those others uh, that um, typically prevent you know, a program like this from starting where your CIO is like, no. OK, so let's back it up and talk about that first, the, the very baseline of what happens when they decide they want to join the cat and become what we call a desk cat. Um, what they're doing, what we're providing for them is, is training and a little bit of work experience. You'd be surprised how many people put this down on work experience when they're applying for their first jobs. But what they're providing for us is that first tier of support. And that's about it. Um, they're willing to reset passwords, make proxy tickets, which is like, yeah, somebody will look at this. Um, and uh, they're, they're going to labs, kicking out people who are smoking pot. That's basically what they do. But, and yeah. Okay. So, but students who want to give back to production, students who want to do more, who want to get into the catacombs, who want to play with servers, who think Linux is pretty cool, they're going to self-select and they're going to start giving back a little bit more. And so here you see, like, we don't ask them to do this part. This part is like setting up an LDAP server. Or, um, this part is like setting up a lab, like moving a lab from one room to another because this is how universities work. Um, they don't have to do this. They asked to do this. They wanted to do this. And so they come self-select and they go to the scratching post, they get into the catacombs, they start learning more and more. And we'll give them simple tasks like, uh, what's a good one, like runaways? Yeah. We ask them to write a script that goes to all the boxes that regular students have access to and looks for processes that are using like an entire CPU or most of the CPU. Things that have been on for more than like six hours that are obviously some kind of a runaway process that needs to be killed. Um, we ask them to like grep logs, we ask them, well, this is kind of out of order, but they do that. Then if they self-select into the catacombs, they can. Oh, they can grep logs. They can start building packages for us. Some of them start learning how to build Debian packages or RPMs. They can, mon they can monitor systems. Um, they, can add, they can even like, start adding like, Nagios checks for us. Um, some of them are really interested in the web stuff, so we give them access to commit to internal web apps. Um, and this kind of like a syndicate team that does the web stuff for us that we'll kind of talk about later. Um, and then they kind of get the ability to, to look at our, our configuration management stuff and our Nagios and our Graphite stuff and be able to like review it and look at it and push changes to test branches if, and then have Claws merge it in. So what classically happens is users come in, or, or these cats come in, and they're like five or six months in or something. They're starting to get their sea legs. They've got Linux on their laptop now, and they're like, I really want 
awesome window manager. And what we ask them, and they're like, can you install this on like the desk computer for us? And we say, well, you should write some Puppet code so that we can have it installed on the desk. And so they make a simple like one line commit to Puppet, but the the things, the skills they needed underneath that commit are all really high demand and really awesome skills. And one of the cool things is they get really good at Git, which is a, a way, we, we manage a lot of things in Git, so we need them to learn Git early on, and that's a really hard thing to teach people. So this helps them get more experience with that. So we let, you know, three months in or something, we let the students into the combs, um, and they start like operating systems installation, setting up services on their own. This is their first shot at root. Um, the catacombs IP space is actually real IP space. So if they set up like a DNS open relay, we get an email about it and yell at them. <laughs> Uh, but what they can do from here now is they can test upgrades for us. They can go load the new Ubuntu and see if it works at all. They can test like an upgrade of a database server. They can play with softwares we've never actually installed before. Um, and they can extend the infrastructure using Puppet commits. They still can't merge them or anything. But now they're starting to write more complicated Puppet code. So at six months in, some so of the students will have documented, uh, demonstrated these three important things. Personal integrity, time commitment, and technical knowledge. So that means that they're reasonably confident on a root shell, we're reasonably confident with them on a root shell, and they're gonna have enough time commitment to the cat outside of their regular four and four hours that they can, that we believe that they'll actually do good things for us like setting up services, killing, or you know, using, or taking care of tickets, doing box reloads, those kinds of things. If those criteria are met, we usually give them some kind of root. So we have a tiered root system that we're not going to really go into, but at the beginning level, um, student routers get access to the client machines, and if, as they go along with us, they might get full access eventually. Um, but at the beginning, they have workstations and services, so they can, they can restart web servers if they're unhappy, they can help debug stuff, they can look at log files that, are, that may be restricted to root, the root user. Um, they have access to some less critical database servers, and the idea of this is to help minimize the blast zone. So if they do make a mistake, we don't want them to take down all the services. We just want them to take down like a single box. And that's fairly easy to fix in our environment. And on the Windows side, there's also a Wintel team that we haven't really talked about. We're both but, on the Unix team. Yeah. Um, but they're given local admin on all of the client server, our client boxes as well, and they help the Windows team with that. Um, and then if they make their way through and are trusted as well, they'll get access to the servers eventually. So um, at some point later, if they've demonstrated more basically technical knowledge and ethical stability, you end up in a situation like this where there's two of us and one of us is a student and one of us is a full-time admin and we're both trying to solve the problem. And if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know which one of us actually worked for the university. It's him. <laughs> All right. We also have a networking team, a web team, and a user support team, but we don't have time for that. Um, I'm going to tell one story, you're going to tell one story, and then questions? Yeah. All right, so the story I want to tell is about a guy named Takua, or I call, his name is Colin, but I call him Takua. And this dude joins the cat, and he's in it for like five months, and he still hasn't gotten in the catacombs. He still hasn't made any kind of route. He still hasn't really done anything, because he's just, he's just hanging on, and he gets stressed. And it's because he has an anxiety issue, and it's because when, it's, when someone asks him a hard question, he breathes in and, and then goes back to his flash games where he's safe. And um, the person who came before him, or someone who's no longer with the cat named Reed, reached out to him and said, there's a problem with our backups. We bought a really nice backup server and we can't use it because our backup software sucks. How about you go learn about this a little bit? And he mentors him one-on-one, -on -one, just a few hours a week. And the, the kid ends up with, we take the, the backup server, we disconnect it from the infrastructure so that he can have root on it, so it's not NFS shared or anything like that. And, and this guy is just learning everything there is to know about Amanda, learning everything there is to know about the weird Linux driver for this tape machine. And six months, you know, just after maybe four weeks of this one-on-one -on -one training with Reed, Takua is the backup expert and the new backup system is in production. And Takua's entire self-confidence just grows. It's, it, it leaks into other parts of Colin's life. That's how much confidence this guy got out of this one thing. And then he starts learning all the other aspects of being a system administrator. And then three months later, his year is up, he leaves the brain dump, he leaves college, and he goes and gets a, like a nice job out in Gresham as some system administrator somewhere. And it was all because Reed just sat him down and gave him direct one-on-one -on -one access in a program that encourages that kind of thing to happen. All right, so my story is about this really quiet girl that showed up on the first day of Brain Up. She was really like, you know, she didn't, want, she didn't really say anything a lot. She was just kind of quiet. And then uh, she, I, I guess like, I don't really know why she showed up for the, but eventually she started showing up at the Splatnix meetings, which is our kind of Unix meeting. And 
eventually, like, you know, she spoke up a little bit more. We gave her some tasks. Um, they were mostly kind of web-based as stuff, like working on her internal PHP apps and stuff. And she started growing her confidence. And eventually, we gave her a client root. And she's like, what? I don't know anything. Why did you give me root? And um, she didn't really get over it at that point. But we kept giving her more tasks. She kept doing more stuff. We gave her some more root. And then we gave her like the final root level. And she's like, I don't know anything. Like, but she, at that point, she did know a lot. Um, and the best part was, as the new year came in, like she saw the new group and she saw how little they knew and then she finally like came to this conclusion like epiphany that she knew a lot a lot of stuff and that was like a great like experience seeing how she grew throughout the whole year um, and, and at that point um, at the beginning of the year our director w had so much confidence in her that he had her be one of the people at the orientation that like told her story and at, at and like her story was pretty cool because like she started out like really quiet and nervous and stuff, and then like she told it really like, like not not a lot of sugarcoating. She just kind of told it how it was, and there was just kind of this like awe left in the room afterwards, and that that was kind of the story of of Colleen. So it's pretty cool. And and now she has a cool internship um, this summer, and then hopefully we'll get her back in fall to do more cool stuff. Are there any questions for us or Lance and Ken? Yeah, we'll bring Lance up and we can talk. Yeah, so you were first. We make each one of them run one, right one. So like, do the students know when you're like having them do something to help you, you're going to like just scrap it and have someone else do it too? So, so this is the way it works. A, a student, like th for the first task is a printer script. Um, so what they do first is they need to manually print to every printer in each lab. So we encourage them to write a bash script to do it for them. Uh, like the, 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 the senior people don't need to do the printer check, so like they'll make their own scripts and one of them will be really good, but each student is expected to make their own so that they can learn how to do sh basic shell scripting. And they're, or they can program in any language they want. It's not really, a, like a, at that point, it's not really a useful tool for us. Uh, eventually, they will help us with real scripts. But this is kind of just a learning stepping stone one. Yeah, we ask them, there's a ticket that goes out every, every shift for find the runaway processes. And the idea is that each student writes a, a script to help them solve this problem. So they, it, they, they call it their, printer, their runaway script. I have, have it. Oh. people rotating in and out frequently, and the owner isn't necessarily the person who wrote it. It's where ownership would naturally fall. Our turnover varies quite a bit over the, over the years. So we usually keep students for an average of two, three years. Uh, I don't know what our. So it, people stay there long enough to have written a significant portion of that code, even though the code was there before them. The person who originally started the code was maybe years before them. So uh, they get ownership of the part of the code that they worked on. Uh, and we, um, what else to say about that, really? Uh, write, writing code, once you've written some code and you see it work and you see clients uh, respond to it and you're on the RC channel explaining to people what you did and how it fixes their problem, uh, you have ownership over that no matter who, who takes over the code or who wrote it to begin with. On our side, uh, for the cat anyway, we kind of have a problem with ownership of code. Like we have some apps, but we don't really have a web team, so it all ends up on like one person, and then he like delegates access to people. And some people get really good at some apps, um, and they try to pass on their knowledge before they leave. We have we have like brain saves. Like before someone leaves, we try to get as much information out of them as possible to like a big group of volunteers. But it's hard. And there's a thing in this where uh, there's a back. One to three year annual stay, you're leaving, if you get rid of somebody, if somebody who's been there for three years is leaving, their responsibilities and what they've been doing don't easily translate to other people. They just can't do it. So there's this, this hole at the top where stuff needs to get done. And that causes these junior guys to lose, or girls, to really step up. And that's what creates the ownership, is that there's nobody in the IRC channel to answer this question. So I better do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's exactly what happens with us. That makes a lot of sense. It's just that I don't see that happening in my environment. I see, well, like, 
who wrote this program? Well, we have a lot of students with a lot of positive energy that want to help. <laughs> yeah, our, our students see they're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll rewrite it and make it better. Well, at the OSL, we have a lot of overlap, too. So a student comes in, there are already three more senior students there that teach them. And so, so there's overlap. There's never, oh, this was written by some guy that nobody here knows and we don't know why. There's always some con continuity there. Uh, I don't know if I would say that uh, exactly, but... There's something I like to tell my mentor. <laughs> you don't know why I'm telling you this now, but you will. That's because I need to tell, because right now I'll just do this one. But you should know how to do this because one day I won't be here. So like, for the last year or so, I've been preparing people for my leaving, by doing my best to train the things that aren't easily trained or, or just kind of tricks I picked up. That don't make sense. How do you balance that with deadlines? Well, we don't have deadlines. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point the whole point is that the cat doesn't need to exist but we want it to and it's fun well, I think we, we, we met our time yeah, unfortunately thank we you we'll be in the hacker lounge and it's easy to find us yeah yep. easy to find us so feel free to ask us questions or anything but thanks